Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Matt Kahn. Welcome, Matt. Well, thanks for having me. You're Great welcome. to be here. Yeah. Um, I met Matt out at the Science and Non-Duality Conference along with his wonderful partner, Julie Dittmar, and uh, my immediate impression of Matt is like he's just this kind of bundle of love and energy, and <laughs> within seconds after you meet him, he's giving you a big hug, and really uh, enjoyable guy. Um, and I've, oh, I, speaking of enjoyable, I've, I've been listening, as I usually do, to recordings of you throughout the week. I often do that in preparation for the interview I'm about, about to give. And um, Interesting stuff. I mean, you, you have an interesting blend of um, sort of non-dual message. Uh, but on the other hand, you have stuff that would you know, make non-dual people's hair curl you know oh, yeah. <laughs> all kinds of embellishments and and richness of relative considerations of psych psychological emotional issues and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> angels and all kinds of things um of course yeah and and that actually resonates with me i'm i'm not your plain vanilla non-dual kind of guy i think that you know that level of reality is is perfectly valid but there's also you know a whole range of other possibilities which you could dismiss as illusory, but um, which have their own significance, their own value. Yeah, and and in in touching upon that, mm -hmm. which we can in so many ways, I, I think what's very interesting because I've, you know, in having the honor to speak and met in front of many non-dual audiences as well as many mystical audiences, uh, which is always an interesting uh, play, mm -hmm. because some of these audiences are focusing on one aspect of the journey mm -hmm. and I think what it feels like I'm here to do is to be a part of integrating and bringing it all together into a much bigger uh, picture and possibility where everything can be equally included where we don't have to necessarily embrace one possibility af at the exclusion of another and and I think one of the biggest things that we can look at is looking at how kind of segmented or segregated a lot of the aspects of spirituality are, that this school of thought talks about angels, and of course this other school of thought talks about that being illusory, and there, there's no self, and then of course there's this other side that wants to improve the self. And I think that when we find ourselves experiencing things in a very integrated way, uh, we find that only in our own direct experience can we actually know the truth but to also recognize that the truth and the way it manifests is unique for every individual. So to say that one teacher teaches the truth is going to exclude the possibilities that how the truth unfolds for you may be something completely refreshing and new that many have never heard or considered before. In the direct experience of truth, what we actually come to see is that the truth, when I say truth, I say truth as a pointer to just seeing itself, that seeing doesn't see illusion. It could see the label of illusion, but that seeing doesn't actually see illusion. Seeing just sees. And so the truth of just seeing seeing just sees experiences. So just as I, as I can say I see you right now is the exact same experiences as I've had with angels and ascended masters. Of course, knowing that you and I having this kind of dialogue and conversation is just as much a play of consciousness as speaking with ascended masters and angels on an etheric realm of reality. And so if we start to see that it's all one play, and no matter what floor of experience we're talking about, it's equally all a play, but it's a play that does not actually involve any form of illusion, because if we were just to see from the truth of seeing, we would see that no one's being eluded. I find it convenient to like use physics as an, as an example. I mean, out at the sure. Science and Non-Duality Conference, we heard a couple of physicists speak, and and you know a physicist will tell you that Newtonian physics the, the level of obvious you know cause and effect has complete validity and it's all been yeah. work, worked out in great deal detail mathematically and so on uh, the quantum mechanical level completely obviates or completely you know it has its own rules which are mm -hmm. which don't apply on the Newtonian level and vice versa but neither one invalidates the other right and if we are going to investigate this journey and not just to trust the words of a teacher and then become the uh, salesman 
of other people's findings. <laughs> if we are to be our own investigation, we are, if we're going to dare to see for ourselves what other people inspire us to, to look and see for ourselves, then we have, to, we have to begin with an innocent intention that everything is valid. Because if not everything is valid to being explored equally, we're never going to know the truth if we're entering into the exploration with such ideas or assumptions that already excludes a possibility that could show you something that quite honestly maybe no one else up to this point has seen this way. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin with the assumption or the intention that everything is valid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you're probably too young to remember this, but um, <laughs> back in the 50s and early 60s, there was a commercial on television for certs. And, oh, yeah. and the way it started was these two twins were arguing with each other, and one was saying, Kurt, search is a candy mint, and the other was saying, search is a breath mint. And mm -hmm. then this Im disembodied voice came in and said, wait, you're both right. Search mm -hmm. is two, two, two mints in one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, so I kind of, it's a humorous way of illustrating the point you just made, which is that it's not either or, you know? Right. And, and w when you said the, the two certs, the two mints in one, uh, that to me reminds me of the physiological basis for awakening that when someone is experiencing what they call separation or ego consciousness it's because the, the left and right hemisphere of the brain are in an argument mm -hmm. and when we actually go through an experience of awakening it's when the left and right hemispheres of the brain whether spontaneously suddenly or gradually over time come into a harmonious balance to where the left and the right aren't arguing side versus side mm -hmm. but is actually able to be in a state of natural balance or equality that of course then allows the consciousness perceiving through this form to see what it sees as clearly as that balance takes place in the brain. And, yeah. and, again, you know. and I heard you refer in one of your recordings to having had uh, some EEG research done on you and, yes. and, and of course there's been a lot of other EEG research done extensively on people yeah. who meditate and so on and they do find that the whole pattern of the functioning of the brain is transformed during deeper, more transcendent, you know, higher states. Yeah, and it was interesting in the EEG, not only did it measure my brain waves, but it measured the brain waves of someone, a participant that was sitting with me, mm -hmm. because we wanted to be able to scientifically measure the transmission of energy that comes through the words I speak when I do offer what I offer, and we found that uh, when I was when we were sitting together in the beginning that their brain chemistry was in one place and mine was in another and then as I began speaking and transmitting because I, when I speak as a transmission of energy mm -hmm. that their brain chemistry began to harmonize in, in the frequency of what mine was already at so we were able to see that and it was pretty interesting and that there was also a part of my brain that we found that um, is almost in a permanent sleep state and so we were th the, the researchers were looking at the fact of maybe because that part of my brain is just asleep that allows me to transmit and be in this space of transmission all the time because my, my experience of awake, if you want to call it that, isn't an experience of something that comes or goes. Uh, it, it's an experience that has been realized, but it's an experience of something effortless that is always there that has nothing to do with a practice or a procedure or that any experience in my life or any, or any experience actually gets in the way of. Right. And, and, and so, of course, it's just an, about allowing us to look so deeply into our experience so that we can see in ourselves not only what is the deepest truth of who we are, which of course is just looking at what in ourselves doesn't change in time, but to see that that which we are indivisible from actually doesn't is in no way limited or obscured by anything in experience, but it is just seeing each experience in the deepest, most intimate way. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could use this brain example to um, probe a little bit more deeply into the word transmission. Yes. Be because I would, how about this? Just as there was nothing physically going from your brain to that person's brain, right? Um, on the sa in the same way, when you say transmission, it's it's not so much or correct me if you disagree, but it's not so much that something is sort of some woo-woo rays are being transmitted <laughs> from, from Matt to, to so-and-so, yeah. but, but rather that there's a, a sort of a resonance or an attunement which yes. takes, which takes yes. place, um, yes. which kind of brings the other person into alignment with that which is already there for them, but which yes. they may, may be a little bit out of tune with. Yeah, so, so if we are using a, uh, the example of a radio, mm -hmm. I'm attuned to a frequency. 
and another radio sits with that other radio, and soon the other radio starts to be attuned to the same frequency and play the same, you know, frequency of sound that the other one is. Although I will tell you, that just, you know, just, just for the sake of uh, sharing experiences, I will tell you about an experience that um, I can't really explain, um, and it was, it was a pretty profound experience, was I was doing a, a session with someone, and it was a very intense session, and, and it was around, you know, this idea of letting go and really just surrendering and letting go, and she got to this point of really intensely, you know, I, I can't let go, I don't know what letting go means, I, I can't, and, it was, and, and there was this intensity between us building and building, um, and out of nowhere, and I... Again, I can't explain this. There, it, what I can only describe was it felt like a lightning bolt shot through my eyes hmm. and hit her in what would be called the third eye. Mm -hmm. And she fell over. Hmm. And at that moment, you know, of course, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> hope you're okay. <laughs> and so I sat there for a second going, you know, what just happened? Because, again, I have, I, it was so sudden and spontaneous. And then, of course, she, in a bewildered state, sat up. And from that moment forward was, was seeing life in a totally different perspective. And for her, that was a deep, profound awakening experience. Of course, I didn't, you know, push any button to make that happen. Right, it just happened. It, it, but but I, I can tell you, I've had experiences of, <laughs> I've had experiences of the woo-woo rays. <laughs> so I will tell you yeah. that that also should not be excluded. Because not only have I had the woo-woo rays shoot out of my eyes at people, Mm -hmm. to create the most profound opening. But I will also tell you that I've actually had the woo-woo rays shot at me. It actually happened when I met Ramdas. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I was hit with the woo-woo rays through Ramdas, <laughs> and then I was the one that shot him at someone else afterwards. So that happened first. Yeah. So it, um, when I met Ramdas, he and I met at a retreat, and he and I had a connection, and, and we had this moment before the retreat ended, and he just looked at me. And out of nowhere, again, this like blinding bright light just shot out of his eyes and hit me in the third eye. Mm -hmm. And in a bewildered state, I wandered back to my seat. <laughs> and, you know, mind was completely empty. And, and my mind was completely empty before that, but it was just a deeper, more exaggerated level of that emptiness, mm -hmm. of that I don't know. And then again, a few months later is when that happened with me and that other person. So again, I, I will say, even though I, I do agree that when I say the word transmission, uh, it is an attunement to where the energy that is radiating uh, through this form is just giving the person, the people in the presence a chance to attune to that same frequency and then being able to experience it different in how life sees or to explore themselves in a, in a different way. But again, but not to exclude that the, uh, <laughs> that the woo woo rays live. Oh, I'd have to agree with you there too. And it's, here's our cat. People Hello, poking, cat. Poking her little ears. <laughs> <laughs> she had a rough day. We had to take her to the vets. Oh, um, blessings she, to your cat. She's doing okay. But um, I'd have to agree with you. It's another one of those both and things where, you know, the first statement is true. The second paradoxically different statement is also true, and both are, are parts of a larger wholeness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can take examples of batteries. I mean, people become surcharged with subtle energy the way batteries become surcharged with electrical charge or clouds, you know. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, there's a discharge from one cloud to the other, to use your lightning bolt example. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and then there's a sort of a equalization of energies. Um, what I also find, though, just in, in, in when I've talked about this, and, cert, you know, of course, I've I've – had experiences of sharing these kinds of experiences in non-dual audiences when I've been asked about it. Mm -hmm. And what I find is just, and again, this will sound very funny, but I know you know what I'm talking about, and of course everyone listening will know, is that you can be in a non-dual path, which is wonderful. I think it's all beautiful because mm -hmm. it's all relevant. It's just a matter of how long you spend in one path and whether or not you're aware of, I'm here for this and then it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the irony that at every stage of your development, whatever you learned before, not only doesn't isn't relevant anymore, but what you may encounter next may even contradict what you learned before. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of people who, who are, who become, and this is a very contradictory statement, become, condition, become conditioned to non-duality. Uh -huh. And then when you speak about something like this, it's either rejected, or what I find is that there is an interesting element of underneath it all of actually being afraid of experiences, that when we're in the non-dual reality, we have come to a deep truth, we revere the teachers who speak such deep truths, and it leads us to think that there's, 
that that's the end all be all and then we wind up defending those words at the expense of experiences that could take us well beyond um, any realm or scope of understanding yeah well I think that uh, you know a lot of times in contemporary non-duality there is a a tendency to become conversant with the terminology yes and to perhaps mistake that fluency yes. for for the experience to which the terminology actually refers yes um, and when you know when and when understanding isn't fully grounded in experience fundamental right. fundamentalism creeps in absolutely and, and I what I see a lot of is a lot of people who can speak very eloquently with certain usage of words but although for me as just someone who has always had a very intuitive sense, my intuitive sense is I feel into people's words and I can feel whether or not it's grounded by experience or grounded by learned conceptual knowledge. And so my, my interest, whether I'm helping someone in whatever school of thought they're in or you know, for at whatever stage of development someone's in, my interest is in giving direct experiences so that one can be their own source of wisdom and insight uh, metaphorically speaking I'm just here to be a flashlight and they're the one walking the path oh I, I totally agree I mean reading a cookbook doesn't satisfy your hunger you know <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny and these that's guys very... you know the, the the people we all revere as the sort of bright lights of non-duality like Shankara and Ramana Maharshi and all sure. you, you can bet these guys weren't just sort of parroting words they were living in a truly sure. non, non-dual state which encompassed sure. and engulfed everything right. and, that, and that's why you find them all to be so kind of comfortable with paradox with, with yeah. you know recommending all sorts of things which might not sound very non-dual but which might be appropriate for a person at that particular stage What's very interesting is that when you experience, when, when there is the deep awakening and when it becomes an abiding living reality, when it's not just I've awakened to the truth of existence, but it's being a living embodiment of what's been realized, then the, the, the paradox is really hysterical. And, and what happens is, is that you begin to be a living transmission of a certain depth of understanding, and yet your living experience is being totally free of all forms of understanding. And I think if that's not recognized, then the words that people speak can be very confused of where the words are leading one to explore. Mm-hmm. And so when, when, there's a, when we are really rooted in a deep realization that's not only just cracking the door open, but fully stepping through the door into the unknown, we are completely free of understanding. Therefore, the words that we speak aren't because people need to know what I have to say, but they become almost a celebration and a decoration of what's been realized in whatever unique way this form is going to express that realization. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times there can be the gathering of insights, the gathering of words, concepts, and yet inevitably you're only gathering the concepts to eventually throw it into the fire just so that you can experience what I call the final surrender, which is freedom from understanding hmm. and just to probe that a little bit freedom from understanding wouldn't yes. necessarily mean not would, would it mean not understanding or would it mean just sort of uh, having a fairly generous dose of appreciation of mystery at all times in addition to whatever you could actually articulate in concepts right I would say freedom of understanding is, is freedom from the need to understand Okay. So it, it doesn't mean you won't understand. It means in every moment something will be understood that may only be relevant for that moment, uh-huh. and that in every moment what will be understood will always come to you, and if something, some understanding doesn't come to you, then there's nothing more you need to understand. And so the freedom from understanding is actually really an invitation into the experience of acknowledgement. When we say the words direct experience, direct experience is an experience of acknowledging. And so, for, for example, when we see each other right now, We can acknowledge each other, but we don't necessarily need to have any kind of understanding in order to see one another. So the acknowledgement is there prior to understanding. And even if we think in a societal view, if we think in everyday, you know, in the everyday material, not so spiritual world, whatever people call it, you know, even when we come to the rescue and aid and assistance of other people in their moments of complete uncertainty. Any act of heroism doesn't come as a direct result of any understanding, but is an immediate impulse and response of acknowledgement, of seeing. 
And so the understanding is just a decoration, a celebration of infinite possibility. It is the ability to comprehend and to fathom how infinitely potential, infinite potential happens to be. At the same time, it is the need to understand, hold on to what you understand, or to seek a further understanding that actually gets in the way of the simplicity of just acknowledging what is only here to be acknowledged. In fact, one of the deepest realizations on the path is that the need to understand will never free you from the need to understand, but only lengthen the ability for you to need things to understand. <laughs> and, then, and then when that breaks apart, we find an invitation into the simplicity of acknowledgement, which is just seeing what I see is only here to be seen. So could we, for instance, use the word freedom from the need to understand? Would that be a, a, a good sure. way of saying it? And would Absolutely. another way of saying it be freedom from the need for certainty? Um, I would, yeah, freedom from the need for certainty, but the freedom from, the, freedom from any need for certainty is actually the uh, death of doubt. So what's interesting is if we really look into all of the levels of certainty that exist in words and teachings, those that have the need to be the most certain are the ones that have not confronted or have not faced their own inner doubt. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course, you know, as, as children, we see that with the mentality of bullies. And we see how, how the opposites, you know, operate in such an interesting way. So I would say that because if I said it's, it's, the, it's freedom from the, from the need for certainty, someone might hear these words and then try to not be certain in their life, and that won't address the doubt. And so I would rather point people towards the source of certainty, which is doubt, and that if we really face the doubt, the doubt is an invitation into making contact, into acknowledging our own innocent nature, that it's the willingness to be in communion or in relationship with acknowledging the various aspects of our own innocent nature that actually not only unravels the doubt, but leaves us nothing to be certain of other than the willingness or ability to embrace and acknowledge whatever appears. Would you say maybe that um, the need for certainty and the addiction to certainty in some yes. cases is an attempt to kind of mask the fear that, uh, of not knowing, the fear of doubt? Um, I mean, people do crazy things and, yeah. uh, uh, based upon certainty. They fly airplanes into buildings and they, yeah. you know, they do all kinds of horrible things to each other because they're certain that they feel so strongly that this is the right thing to do that they, right. go, ahead, they, they go ahead and do it. Um, but uh, in my own case, I, um, you know, I found myself in a way, it's, it's again paradoxical because in a, way, mm -hmm. the, in a way there's a greater certainty and a greater s kind of assuredness and so on that grows, but kind of counterbalancing that, there's a, a kind of a, comf a comfort with uncertainty or with not knowing. Or of with course. Not, not needing to kind of pin things down. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think people are afraid of uncertainty really because if they are, they're afraid of their ideas of uncertainty, which of course the irony is being afraid of your ideas of certainty is just more known or more more imagined certainty. So it's not really uncertainty. I think that I don't think people are even afraid of doubt. I think people are afraid of facing the doubt that's already there. Right. right. So I I, th I think that what people are afraid of, if I were to be perfectly honest and just feel into the question, mm -hmm. is the doubt is, again, everything that we find within ourselves is not an enemy, it's really an ally. So the question is, how do, what do I do when I face doubt? So if we knew what doubt represented and what it invites us to do, it may not be something to steer away from because when people feel doubt, they feel vulnerable and then they feel more susceptible for threats or that what they have can be taken away and then the impermanence of everything starts to really kind of you know, really turn up the heat in our experiences. But really doubt is an opportunity to face the most vulnerable part of ourselves that if we can acknowledge and recognize that any part of myself that I face, and when I say part, I don't mean that we're all fragmented, but just, you know, different colors of the rainbow. But if when we find that sense of doubt within ourselves, that, that is the innocence within ourselves that wants to be loved, wants to be embraced, but remembers either not being loved and embraced by those it wanted to be loved by, or that the love that it let in was either taken away, rejected, or somehow, somehow lost in some moment of impermanence. So I find that the basis of doubt 
is really a conflict of I want to open up and receive love and be loved and love others, but I'm actually afraid of losing what I give or losing what I let in or being further rejected in some form of way. So it's really just the, it's, it's the wanting of love and being afraid to receive it simultaneously that I find energetically creates the basis for doubt. Yeah. Interesting. I, for some reason, as we were talking about this, the, you know, the example of a religious fundamentalist came to mm -hmm. mind. Uh, I've never been one, although I've encountered a few. Sure. Uh, actually, <laughs> I sort of have been one in a sense, you know, <laughs> back in my sure. um, meditation movement days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there's this sort of like kind of underlying attitude that, you know, this belief structure that I've bought into or been mm -hmm. bor born into or whatever is the right one. Everything else is the wrong one. Mine is mm -hmm. better. Mine is better. Those people are deluded. I'm going, to, he I'm going to heaven. They're going to hell. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a kind of a, 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 an effort required, I think, to cling to that because there's so many things which constantly challenge it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's scary. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, in some of these groups, you're told, don't think too much. You know, don't read books. Don't listen to people <laughs> because thinking is the devil trying to get you to just sort of, you know, loosen up your, 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 your tightly held beliefs. And so just ha hang on tight. <laughs> uh, and that's an extreme that's, example. But I think there, there are gradations or shades of that, you know, to every degree th um, throughout, <laughs> throughout society. Sure. And perhaps we can all identify a little bit of that in ourselves. No, absolutely. And, and, and to me, it all comes down to so many philosophical viewpoints, the comparing, the contrasting from one extreme to the other. You're right. I'm wrong. For me, the, the basis for what, what, I, what people call ego, I call the dream of denial. And the dream of denial is basically a game called I'm right and you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Or it can also be where the ego turns on itself and it's you're right and I'm wrong. So a lot of times when we're seekers, what we're seeking is I'm the one that's wrong, the teacher is the one that's right, and I'm seeking to be like the teacher and be their salesman and promote their teachings and mm -hmm. fight against people who I think are wrong because I'm right on, on behalf of the teacher, or I'm the one now who has realized what I've realized. I'm right, you're all wrong. I mean, <laughs> appar apparently, and, and this is not really all that fun, but apparently one of the more alluring fantasies in ego is being the one who knows it all living within a kingdom of infinite morons. Now, I will tell you that that's not the greatest amount of fun because the basis for all these teachings that we talk about, whether we frame them as non-dual or we frame them as esoteric, it all brings you to a place of discovering within yourself the reality of love. And then to celebrate the reality of love through an intimate relationship that not only reflects how you relate to yourself within one body, but how you relate to yourself as the infinite reflections and encounters of what we see as a world. And when I say love, I don't say love is an emotion. I don't say love is the payoff of finding the perfect person in the world. But I say love as the celebration of acknowledgement or seeing seeing itself in one form or another. So just when seeing sees that it's only seeing reflections of its own potential, that's where love arises, and love is the equality of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. So when we are seeing clearly, we are acknowledging everything with equality. We are recognizing everything through the equality of acknowledgement, and there is just seeing, seeing its own reflection whether within an interaction between two people, whether as a baby taking its first steps in a brand new world of shapes and colors, whether as someone who awaits their final breath on the deathbed, or as someone planting flowers and seeds in a garden. It's all just seeing, viewing its own reflection, and embracing itself within an infinite spectrum of possibilities. And that, that, that celebration of seeing, acknowledging itself throughout the infinite depths of equality is what I refer to as the reality of love, which if there is to be an awakening, it's awakening to that reality that simply decorates itself as body and world. Hmm. That's beautifully put. Um, as I understood that, as I was listening to it, yeah. um, I, I, I qu equated seeing in, uh, with sort of the divine consciousness or you know, infinite awareness or universal intelligence or God even if you like and um, you know if if God or divine intelligence whatever is really 
uh, omnipresent, it's really not, not just sort of off in some corner, then mm -hmm. it, it obviously permeates everything. It must be the seer, it must be the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this whole play, you know, as one put, teacher put it, we, you know, the divine kind of loses itself so it can find itself. Uh, um, right. You know, it creates this whole uh, fantastic universe um, as an exploratory tool for coming back and, and, you know, living itself as an embodied reality. Mm -hmm. um, and even, and yet, even the losing itself and finding itself is just, an, it, that in itself is another phenomenon in the play because in order for us to say that it loses and finds itself is based on the labels we impose on the things that actually don't label themselves in that way. If we were just to see this moment and just gather our evidence only from seeing, we would see that there's actually no suggestion of lost or found, there's actually just seeing. So even, even as that, as true as it is, is only true within the framework of a certain context or philosophy, which is wonderful because it's all equal in consideration, but to actually see that what keeps us actually from finding the truth on this path is the assumption that something's been lost and the reason why it seems to take so long for a lot of people is because they're trying to find what has never been lost and they're trying to discover what they think remains unseen and yet when we come to a point of true sincerity and we say I'm just going to see what seeing sees we see that seeing sees reflections, it sees objects it sees objects that don't call itself objects. It sees things that don't call themselves whatever we would call it. And it also sees whatever label and meaning has been imposed upon it. And when we can allow ourselves to explore what this moment is like, to just see what we see and see that it doesn't ask us to call, us, call it anything. And so when we just see what's in front of us without a need to refer to it the way it doesn't refer to itself, we gain vital evidence that has the potential to unravel every teaching we've gathered up to this point, but allows us to be a living expression and transmission of the teaching and, and to confirm in ourselves what no amount of gathering and debating teachings can ever help us uncover. We have to actually just look at if nothing that I see calls itself anything, what is this moment like when I just see? When I just acknowledge what I see and rest in that observation, what can be realized? What is present? What is being revealed to me? Just in that simple invitation. And that's where I think things get really interesting. Yeah. Um, here I think maybe though we get into a little bit of the description prescription conundrum um, mm -hmm. where where you know a person let's say who is a very clear seer to yes use, to turn that into a verb um, or noun actually uh, describes their experience mm -hmm. uh, and other people listen and maybe their clarity of seeing is not so acute uh, there could be a lot of cloudiness a lot of occlusion Yes. And they hear the other guy talk, and it sounds good, mm -hmm. but but does that necessarily enable them to uh, see it with the clarity that the guy talking has? Um, not, I, I suggest maybe no. I mean, you walk up to the average person on the street and talk, say what you just said, and mm -hmm. he'll be like, okay, buddy, i got to catch a bus. Um, Depends. But, yeah, maybe not, but... Um, isn't there something to be said, like for instance, you said you were talking earlier about brain waves. Isn't there something to be said for culturing the capacity of this mechanism to uh, see clearly? Um, and there could be, you know, a lot of gunk in the in the mechanism that needs to be sort of um, purified. And and I realize this whole idea of purification and progress is um, mm -hmm. ana anathema in many non-dual circles. But mm -hmm. practically practically speaking, it seems to be um, relevant. What I would say is this, is that if, if one is teaching from a position of believing things need to be purified, then it will be suggested things need to be purified, and then a world will appear to confirm the need for many people to be purified and to need that teaching, because it's just a confirmation of that belief. At the same time, when, one, when one's heart has developed a level of sincerity, that sincerity may be willing to look and see things in a way that could be spontaneously inspired by this, what, what I call a transmission, or through just a simple instruction of just looking to gather your own evidence. So 
from my perspective, I actually don't, I don't actually think that one particular thing is necessary because when I sit in front of every person or if I sit in front of a group, I'm just guided to say whatever that group or individual needs to say, which is perfect for them. Mm -hmm. There may be a series of unravelings of things that have been believed to be true um, that may sp spontaneous happen, spontaneously occur in one moment that may occur over time, but I can say that it never is one way for any individual. At the same time, what I can also tell you is the deeper game of spirituality, which is the deeper that any teacher or person who is teaching is living and embodying this truth is the ease to which anyone who they're speaking with can have a deeper experience of, of realizing what life is like through their eyes just in any conversation. I mean, I, I've had experiences of talking to people many years ago when I first started this path using such d direct descriptions and having them look at me like I'm talking a foreign language. In the last few months, I've talked to people about bagels, and they've erupted into, into realizations. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean anything special or spectacular about me necessarily. It's just reflecting into a world how deep this realization and living reality has, has blossomed. Because again, as deep as it arises within oneself, the world just reflects back that clarity throughout the play of individuals. So I, I think that instead of looking at what needs to be done for a teaching to be effective, what I think is a more specific interest is looking at how effortlessly others are able to awaken as a celebration of how deeply such teachings are not parroted but embodied by the one who's teaching them. Okay, so you just referred then to an uh, evolution in your teaching ability, we could mm -hmm. call it, yeah. um, over many years presumably. Yeah. Um, now, what, f what facilitated that evolution? Why did you not just snap from initial awakening to the degree of depth and effectiveness that you have now? Why was there a maturation process? The maturation process is because I came into this path knowing nothing about the path and the maturation process was me learning about all the different pockets and corridors and games that I didn't know people were playing in spirituality because I came into this path knowing nothing about it. Mm -hmm. I was just following my own intuitive guidance and I started going through these awakening experiences but I didn't know any of the words. I didn't read a book. I didn't know any of the formal teachings. I mean I would have people come to me and talk to me about something called an I am and for about a year I had no idea what people are talking about because my experience was just my own direct seeing and it had nothing to do with an I am presence or people talk about awareness and, 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 and so I was present in all of the sessions and times that I offered people and I would spontaneously say things that I had nothing I had no idea about and I listened to all the things that I said in sessions not realizing that all the time I spent with people was was also educating myself on the game that I didn't know spirituality was and all the different ways people can get caught up in the certainties and the fundamentalism and so I, I see if I look back I see the maturing process and the gradual opening to all of this as helping me to understand what I now have the honor to help other people through but it sounds like your maturation process was not just a matter of um, accumulating different understandings based right. on interacting with different people right. but, that, but that there has been a profound maturation in, in your own depth of experience absolutely because in order for someone to help people through some of these deep stages they have to have the most direct experience of what they're helping people through right. and so so I've I have not only explored the understanding of what people can get caught up in but I've experienced it as I am which of course if we look at how life and the divine experiences all expressions of life the I am is just the intimacy or the immediacy of how close the one is to all expressions of itself, right? It's not sitting in the theater watching a screen, it's actually sitting within the appearing forms, experiencing the life of the character within the movie. Mm -hmm. So I've had the most direct experience of all these experiences of awakenings. I've also had very profound awakenings where I, I mean literally one experience, I, I, had, I heard the sound of a, lo a loud popping in my head and and then it felt like it felt like you know warm liquid oozing out of my ears and at that moment every memory of my life and every idea of myself was completely gone and yet i i had an ability to function in a world 
but it, it was the most um, it was the most comfortable form of amnesia. I was actually in a Target store. I was in the middle of shopping, and all of a sudden I walked, and there's this pop that happened, and I just and this woman actually came up to me, and she she was working at the store, and she said, "Do you need any help?" And I started laughing, and I said, "I, I said, don't know." Get a mop. <laughs> yeah, I said, I don't know. I don't. I don't even know what I'm doing here. And then I started looking at the like, why? Why am I holding a hanger of clothes? Why would I buy this stuff? Why do I need? Why do I need cloth? Why do I? It just nothing. Nothing made sense. At the same time, there was a level of order within me that knew intuitively. So it wasn't like this completely chaotic twilight zone experience. It was surreal. And again, from that moment on, my life has been a living you know, has been living in that surreal, empty reality. At the same time, I've also seen that being, you know, being that emptiness, realizing that emptiness, experiencing nothing but the infinite abundance of emptiness, that within that emptiness, there's an intention for that emptiness to then accelerate itself throughout the decoration of form. And what I find a lot of is that people get into that empty state and then when they start to move back into form, they start to think it's the ego coming back, or they start to think it's um, they start to think it's actually them going backwards instead of actually completing the journey. So there's the emptiness. Then there's the now that you realize that the at at the very primal level, there's nothing but emptiness existing. Now the emptiness wants to attend its own costume party, and a lot of people I find in the non-dual community and in, in a lot of different communities try to rest or be complacent in the emptiness as a, as if it's a point of attainment, and they actually keep themselves from fully completing the journey or closing the gap, as some people say, because they're not willing to then experience the emptiness simply through a, a, a decoration of appearance. Mm -hmm. And so, I, again, it's, it's, there's been some very sudden things that I've experienced. I mean, my first one was when I was five years old, and then when I was eight, and then throughout my life. But at the same time, it's also been very gradual in the sense of me being able to experience directly all the various nuances that come with this path that you know, really includes obviously realization, but realization is very widely spoken about, but it's, it's really just the doorway. Yeah. Now, I have yet to encounter anyone who I honestly believe is not continuing to grow and has not, you know, continued to undergo what we might call a maturation process. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of times the word awakening is used in a sort of, with a sense of finality and it's yeah. kind of a static connotation, like, yeah. oh, I, he, are you awake? Right. And, you know, how can you answer that in a, in a you know, with, with a sort of a, a definiteness? You, you can say, yeah, but, you know, sure, there's, but there's, but, but like the infomercials say, but yeah, but wait, there's more, <laughs> you know? Um, and obviously there is something, some element which doesn't change and which in and of itself can't undergo any change or evolution but as you were just saying the expression of that yes it, you know the embodiment of that the, yes the refinement of mm -hmm. the instrument through which that is lived I, sure. I can't I, I can't see that there's any limit to the growth in that realm and why should there be I mean to think that to think of awakening as being final is when we're thinking of it in terms of attainment mm -hmm. I think a lot of times the reason why people want it to be final and want to either claim that they've reached the final destination or like to try to uh, pick apart people who they think are claiming the final destination is that we really seek a, fi a final destination because what we really seek is a fantasy of I finally want to get to a place where I no longer obligate myself the right to believe I'm deficient in any way. So it's the fear of deficiency that creates the need to, to pursue awakening as a final destination. Whereas if I said to you, you know, are you awake? You are awake. But that has nothing to do with the journey of being like a thousand petal lotus where every moment, every breath is just the unfolding of your own beautiful fragrance. Mm -hmm. for, for me to imagine or for someone to suggest that the journey ever ends is, is not having an understanding of what's on a journey. What's experiencing a journey is experiencing its own never-ending potential which is like listening to the harmony that only expands from one, you know, from one sound to the next. What, why would we want the journey to ever end? What we really want to end is the seeking and the suffering mm -hmm. because we are in some ways perceiving ourselves as something that is believed to be deficient. So if we were, not, if we were to see through the idea and belief of deficiency, we would necessarily we wouldn't necessarily 
think of awakening as the end of anything, when really it's just the beginning of our own exploration. It's the beginning of acknowledging ourselves in all forms. And it's the beginning of celebrating what actually is here appearing throughout the decoration of such beautiful forms. Mm. That's kind of what I was alluding to when I referred earlier to you know purification and progress. It seems yeah. like there, there's a never-ending kind of stream of evolution. Sure. And at, at a certain point, as you're going down that stream, you there, there's a milestone wh which you might you look to the sh uh, which you might call awakening, but then the stream keeps flowing. Um, so it's not like it's a destination; it's more of a milestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I I have yet well I, I already made that point. Well, and, and you, as a funny joke, I would say, you know, just to confirm, because we always have to confirm for ourselves what's true, and mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we say things, I say things very funny, and just th that, that give offbeat ways to do that, but, you know, go into your backyard, wherever you are, or anyone, sit with a tree, ask the tree to let you know when it's finally arrived, and sit and wait and watch what happens. Yeah. <laughs> see if see if the tree knows that it's arrived, or, or say to the tree, "Let me know when you've arrived," mm -hmm. and eventually the cosmic joke will dawn upon you. Mm. That nothing frames itself in any sense of finality or arrival. That everything just is being itself, and it is ex and it is it is expressing however it's decorated. And yet, no matter how it's decorated, has nothing to do with the reality that is appearing, however it appears. And again, that's, people can hear that and think that's a very deep teaching. My interest is giving people the opportunity to actually see that for themselves. And when a lot of people do see that for themselves, they go, oh, I didn't realize it was so simple, and that's how I've overlooked it. And so it's not a matter of getting people to talk about this celebration in the most eloquent way, but getting every people, giving everyone an invitation to actually consciously attend the celebration they're already attending. Because hmm. life is a celebration. I was uh, cross-country skiing through the woods listening to you on my iPod when I heard you tell that thing about the tree. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just want to tell you that all the trees said that you know, they've always been in a state of having arrived. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So the trees told you they arrived. That's, that's yep, good insight. They were all in harmony. We were in unison on that point. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I, I asked a tree whether it's arrived, and it, uh, I was sitting there for a while. Yeah. And, then, uh, and, 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 and again, it's, it's one of those things where... Well, there's just a presence, you know, of to course. to a, anything that animate, right. an, an, an inanimate object. Oh, I guess a tree is more inanimate, more animate than a stone. But there's a sort of a a beingness to right. to everything, which is devoid of any sort of disharmony or dis dis uh, distance from, you know, being what they are at well, the, in the moment. Well, you know what's really interesting is when I look at objects, and this happened when I had that popping sensation in my head when I told you about, mm -hmm. I began to see this, like, how I can describe it is, like when you look at a television set that you, where you don't get the channel and it's that fuzziness, uh -huh. I see, like, what I call a translucent fuzz in and around and between every object. It's this one, and, and if I look at, the, it almost looks like just, just pixels. Hmm. Pixels of energy that if I look really closely, the pixels are going in so many different directions, you can't even make out it as anything, and yet, as a whole, it's not really moving or going anywhere, and I see it with, so when I look at a stone, I see that pixelated energy, and I see the stone as just the way that pixelated energy decorates itself. If I literally right now look at my hand and my arm mm -hmm. with my own eyes, and again, you know, probably it's just seeing through the, the third eye, but I, I actually see that pixelated energy just decorating itself as this arm or this body. And then I had the experience of looking into a full-length mirror at the, because, you know, I started to see this body as a decoration of pixelated energy, and that was a pretty extraordinary experience. And I looked in front of a full-length mirror, and as the pixelated energy started to get more and more intense, the reflection of the body completely disappeared and there was nothing but pixelated energy looking at pixelated energy. There's nothing but seeing, seeing. And so that's when I kind of realized that there is only seeing and yet when we say there's only seeing, if we see and base our evidence on seeing, we see that even though I can say there's only seeing, nothing being seen ever gets in the way of the seeing, it's just being seen. Hmm. So it's, it's, you know, you know, what were you going to say? 
Oh, uh, n- never mind. Uh, th- there was a there's an old movie. I forget the actor's name. It was Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Who's that <laughs> guy? And there yeah. were these li- little ladies in the courthouse that kept calling everybody pixelated. <laughs> sort of chuckling. Sure. Guys. <laughs> no, it's interesting. And again, it's one of those things where a lot of teachings that we use the word only are trying to push other things away that are called distractions so we can see something. But then it develops a relationship where... We have to live our lives on guard with things, that there's certain things that can get in our way, like I I have to make sure that thoughts don't get in the way of awareness or that reactions don't obstruct my awareness and then I'm trying to, you know, keep awareness in the no thinking section or whatever we do. And I think that when we say awareness, awareness is just the availability of seeing, that if we could just see that when thoughts arise, we see thoughts. When feelings arise, we see or sense the feelings when experiences arise, we see them, and so if we just based on seeing, that nothing, even though there is only seeing, nothing actually gets in the way of the seeing, so that, therefore, the journey of clarity is just about how deeply and sincerely we're exploring our own seeing versus trying to purify, perfect, or cultivate the seeing in some preferred way. If we spend time exploring our own seeing, we will see what's always here to be seen. All we have to do is have interest and give it a little bit of attention for something deeper to shine through. And then we find that everything that we see with our eyes or that we feel with our senses is just celebrating that which is here undivided from itself, no matter how it appears. Well, if we spend time exploring it, as you say, then, then that you know, is tantamount to actually purifying so as to sure. <laughs> see more deeply so it's, it's not a dirty word necessarily no um, and I will tell you I will tell you also you know purification I have in my life I've experienced the because I've also seen on a, on a relative level again relative and absolute truth are indivisible so to have a teaching that focuses on absolute truth at the negation of relative is just a higher form of fundamentalism On the level of absolute, we have an absolute reality that is unchanged by time, that does not come or go, no matter what happens in relative life. However, in the relative physical body, we have cellular memories, Mm -hmm. and we have all these different things that, that I see as cellular memories. And as deeply as we go into the absolute seeing, are purged and released, which allow the body to be a clear and purified open vessel to allow what has been realized to shine through in conscious embodiment. So the realization of the absolute is called awakening. The fully purified embodiment of what's been realized can be called Christhood. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, and again, that's another confirmation of my use of the word purification. Absolutely. And, and also there's pre-awakening purification, you know, because sure. it might be there's too much uh, gunk to allow the initial awakening to sure. occur and you get rid of some of that gunk through various whatevers and sure. bingo, you know, you're standing in target and all of a sudden, <laughs> ka- kaboom. And you know, what's interesting and, and just again, I, can, I only share what intuitively comes to me, you know, from the universe, you know, which is the one that I am, but what comes through intuitively is only what I teach. So I, I haven't, you know, I, I never really read on a lot of different teachers. I know of a lot of the different teachings just to keep up on what people are talking about. But what I was taught to do just in my own intuitive journey, what I was, how I was taught to help people purify is that we can purify the physical form and free it of these cellular memories so that not only the realization but the embodiment can be expressed in a very deliberate and harmonious way is by is with love that actually when we feel some pressure in our body where we feel some tightness where we feel some sort of blockage or you know where we feel the reaction that we have when things arise is actually showing us the various parts of the body where it's where where life is showing us to send a series of I love you's to that as we send I love you's to a specific part of the body at the moment we feel the tension that the tension we're feeling is actually feeling what cellular memories are are about to be released through the doorway of the heart. And the I love you's is just what gives it permission to release gently and to no longer breed any kind of identification or attachment. And so in the path that I've been guided to offer, which, you know, a lot of people are seeing it as an integration between the esoteric and the non-dual and bringing, you know, really creating a, a really necessary bridge so we don't have to have two different playgrounds here. But really allowing love to be what purifies the vessel for the deepest awakening 
and of course to allow love to be what is celebrated after such an awakening has unfolded that it begins and ends with love um that thing you said a minute ago about uh you know people getting really established in the absolute perspective and yes. and and, that, and then from that vantage point dismissing all relative considerations i mean there are even some teachers that say well there couldn't possibly be any reincarnation or any karma or anything because that impl <laughs> implies the existence of a person who can reincarnate or who can, re who can receive <laughs> the karma but there is no such person therefore that's all a lot of bunk um right. but I don't know. My answer to that would be that, you know, on some level that's true, and also on a you know more sort of manifest, express level, um, it's true that there's reincarnation and karma. You know, the each right. level of reality has its own integrity, its own um, sure s relevance. Well, and and when people are debunking reincarnation, mm -hmm. let's really be clear on what they're debunking. They're not debunking reincarnation. They're debunking reincarnation as a way of saying, I don't want to believe that I have to earn what I already am, which is true. Mm -hmm. but, th but, but to throw the baby out with the bathwater is just to find ourselves on one level being very insightful, but then bringing ourselves to a conclusion that is equally very limited and ignorant. I mean, to say there's no reincarnation only because I don't want to believe that I have to earn what I spent my childhood earning that my parents never gave me is more of a reflection of conditioning than any spiritual insight. So, it, so it's really, we're in a day and age where we have to really start looking at these teachings and what is being offered in a very different perspective because, again, I've met people that say, oh, there's no reincarnation, and I can feel into their energy, and I go, oh, they spent their life trying to earn the approval of their mother and father who never gave them the payoff, and so now they're having a rebellion against any sort of earning, which is why they're promoting the there's nothing to do teaching because, of course, that correlates perfectly as the solution or remedy to all the things that infuriate them from their childhood. And so if we really start looking at things just in the same way, I meet a lot of people who the people that are the most hard core into non-duality and talking about there's no one there, a lot of times in my experiences are people that have unresolved self-esteem issues. Hmm. And what better way to deal with a you you don't like than to, see, than to say it's not there? Perfect yeah. disassociation, right? And, <laughs> and so we have to really, again, the only thing that's going to really take us into the depth of the mystery, not to solve the mystery, but to experience ourselves as the mystery, is a heart of sincerity and the willingness to say, I'm not here to assume or suggest or project. I'm just here to be open to exploring. Mm -hmm. Because I've, I can tell you, I have had experiences of re, you know, past life memories. I also know past life memories to be parallel lifetime memories because time doesn't exist. Right. I can also tell you I can look within it every time I've had those memories and see there's no one there having them. Mm -hmm. But that's besides the point. See, that's what gets really interesting is when someone can say, but there's no one here to reincarnate. And the universe will say, that's besides the point because it's all the one experiencing itself. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like if you go to a movie theater and you watch the characters on the screen and you say, but what I'm seeing on the screen is not true in my life. And I will say, but that's besides the point. You're still feeling what it's like to be the characters you watch. You see, we have to really get on to the joy of the play. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if someone is really adamant about there being you know no one no reincarnation because there's no one to reincarnate then by the same <laughs> logic there should be no eating you know right <laughs> there's no one to eat so give that <laughs> up <laughs> right it's really beside it's really quite irrelevant and and if someone has not had an experience of reincarnation it, it doesn't really matter and and if someone believes in reincarnation with all their heart it's not going to make it more more uh, relevant it will just be something that is more widely talked about in their conversations um, and more widely debated. The, the, the fact, or what I'll say is the intention of reincarnation is to show that there is a constant reality that continuously exists that is not obstructed by the birth and the death of characters. Mm -hmm. is, really what was re is really what's being pointed to that you, the word you, if I say the word you, you can probably hear that the word you does not sound like body or mind or ego or conditioning. The word you does not suggest any of those associations. That the word you is a pointer towards the witness of that which sees what you see. That that you, the witness, when you explore it, turns, you know, may be discovered 
as being that which acts as the same other you in other bodies. So when you explore the you, you find seeing. And if there is seeing equally existing in all other forms, then maybe there's just seeing seeing itself. And maybe that seeing is what survives all experiences of birth and death. In the same way I use the word alive to point to awake, because I think awake is a little overused, that if we see alive is what's unobstructed throughout all moments, that alive experiences birth, alive experiences death. Birth and death are opposites, but alive has no opposites. That if I asked you, are you awake, you might go through all the different you know, questions of, oh, I don't know if I'm awake, let me go through the checklist. But if I asked you, are you alive, you'd answer it in two seconds flat, and that's how we know we're going in a more clear direction. That perhaps awake is the realization, not only that you're alive, but if you look within, you actually see within your own direct experience, yes, I am alive, and I'm nothing else. Mm-hmm. I am just the aliveness of being that is seeing what it sees and acknowledging the aliveness that I am in whatever form it appears or in whatever way it reflects in something I call the world but it's just reflecting back my belief in that label and meaning. Hmm. That what, what you say is world is really you, what you call a mind is really you, it's just a reflection of what you've said about it. You use the word sincerity a lot. Um, yes. You know, that, and, and perhaps you can f- uh, say the way you say it, that something about if you're really deeply sincere, then such mm-hmm. and such. Um, can, can, can you say that in a nutshell, and then I'll ask you a question about it? Yes, yeah, sincerity is the willingness to explore without limitations. Okay. Now, let's say a person hears that, mm-hmm. and they, they say, well, that sounds good. Um, how do I cultivate that willingness? How do I become more sincere so I can really explore without limitations? I feel stuck. I feel insincere. I, I, you know, I, can't, I don't feel like I'm really living up to that injunction. The funny answer is the survival of your experiences already cultivates that. Like in the old days, you go to a teacher in an ashram and you, you, you know, you'd knock on the door and they'd let you in and the teacher would say, what do you want? You go, I want to wake up. And so the teacher might sense the endless pattern of wanting in that seeker. So they might give a seeker some sort of spiritual practice, which the seeker thinks is there to be mastered uh, to earn the approval of the teacher. But the, the teaching is actually there to cause deliberate, ongoing, abject failure, to, bre- <laughs> to, to break apart all of the barriers to sincerity and once the seeker is in a puddle of misery and disillusionment that the teacher goes oh now there's this innocence presence now I can point and they can look and see and have the lights get turned on pretty quickly Um, but in in today's day and age teachers as far as I'm concerned we, we don't need to do that we don't need to play that kind of game because the survival of your life experiences already uh already makes people well seasoned let's just say that life has a way of seasoning you and, and in, in the survival of all of your disappointments, hardships, and failures, which I know sounds very, <laughs> and that sounds very sexy and seductive, but in the surviving of all those failures and disappointments and frustrations, it breaks apart all of those barriers to receptivity so that whenever we find ourselves in that place of, I don't know what to do, I don't know who I am, I don't know what's next. Once we're in the I don't know, the I don't know is how we know we're, we're prepared to express and to explore that kind of sincerity. So the irony is most of the people that I've ever worked with have been at the exact moment they've gotten to the I don't know. And I've just been there to say, oh, look, they're well seasoned. Now we can just take the journey. Versus in the beginning of my, you know, of my journey when I was helping people, before I had really discovered the depth and this had been embodied in a certain way, I was there helping people through the well seasoning process. But now, it, it, now it seems like just with acknowledging who I've been able to help and how life seems to take shape and form, that life already well seasons everyone and breaks everything apart for us. It's just when we get to that deep, guttural, primal, I don't know, when something like a deep teaching can be very helpful. Hmm. And sometimes what I find when people are the most confused or when they find themselves attached to some of the deepest teachings, when they've taken the regular you know, everyday dream state, and they've basically just re-wallpapered it with spiritual slogans, and they've created a spiritual dream state, I find that what happens, that's because they've started to explore the spiritual journey before life has been finished well seasoning them. Uh, and really, what I think is the best approach is let life break down in you what it needs to break down. Once you get to the, I don't know what the hell's going on, 
that's when we're ready to start the journey. And again, you're, we're going to, you know, I meet people at all different stages of the journey. But in, in order for the most sincere level of inquiry to occur, we let life break down the barriers. When we get to the I don't know, we're ready for a flashlight to shine our way and point us in a different direction. Kind of sounds like AA. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Life about, is like that. They talk about that. I mean, people just sort of getting to the point of complete desperation and yes. then needing to put their faith in something yes. other than their own capabilities, which have totally failed them. Right, because if you don't do it in that order, which not like it has to be in a certain order. I'm just, we're just speaking right. differently. But if you do it out of order, then instead of it being the desperation of not having anything to cling to in your life, it will actually be the desperation of trying to spend all your time holding on to teachings and defending them mm -hmm. in conversations with people. And so, and that, and, and the reason I say it in this order is because it turns out to be the most compassionate path. Mm -hmm. So I find people that when they've done it a little out of order, instead of it being, and again, we all experience desperation, but instead of the desperation being, um, the divine has apparently huffed and puffed and blown my house down <laughs> and I have nothing and I'm naked, which is the best place to enter a spiritual teaching as far as I'm concerned, having nothing and just not knowing how to function like that. The opposite side is I entered spirituality before the desperation huffed and puffed and blew my house down and now my new attachments have become defending and holding onto a teaching. So now the, now the desperation is being afraid of letting go of a teaching and holding it with you know both hands with white knuckles which is is going to turn into a debate which I'm not interested in having with anyone I'm interested when people have have their lives completely turned upside down and now they just don't know how to function in any other way which is when everything is the most open and available to point to the deepest reality and then in that sincere way the integrating into it as a living reality becomes a lot easier yeah well, I have a couple of questions and comments yeah. on what you're just saying. Well, I mean, one is I, I'm sure you're not saying that, you know, if you feel an inclination to pursue spirituality, yeah. you, you should wait until your house has been foreclosed and no, you've lost, lost your know. job and your, no. you know, your kids are on drugs. And, you know, I mean, just, no. you know, just follow your inclinations. On, follow it. Yeah, on the one hand. Uh, and nature, but then the other thing you're saying is that yeah. we don't have to kind of, you know, view life's hard knocks as the enemy no uh, that there's a sort of an evolutionary value in every th there's an innate intelligence in the universe and and everything is being orchestrated for our better good yeah i mean for those that try to avoid what life will unravel naturally they'll find a spiritual practice and that will do the same thing but i'm not saying people should you know what, what like you described wait for no, I got to wait till my life goes to hell before I can enter spirituality. I mean, obviously, <laughs> there is an impulse to be curious. What I would say is follow the impulse of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, if I'm going to say it as a universal statement, I would say follow the innocence of curiosity, which is I'm interested to see what's over here. I'm interested to see what's over there. And then based on what feels good to me, what resonates deeply, what feels natural to me, I will then explore that. And then I'll just see what is true in my own direct experience that all these spiritual teachings are just suggestions, pointers, and I will have to look into myself to confirm which of these correlate to my own sincere, clear seeing, or perhaps is leading me to have a seeing that creates a pointer for others that had never been pointed at before. It's just when we're on the spiritual journey, what I happen to see is that those who have already faced the desperation sometimes have an easier time seeing into the simplicity of what's already true versus those who say they're open but they're just using the examination of other possibilities as a way of continuously defending and selling the teaching that they think is the one eternal truth which of course if there is one way it is the equality of all ways yeah Different strokes for different folks. Um, let's let's touch a little bit upon the whole idea of, of seeking and so on, because you know sure. the, there's a it's all, it's very popular to say give up the search and you shouldn't ah. see, <laughs> should, shouldn't seek and all that stuff. And uh, to me, that sounds like telling a hungry man to give up hunger. Right. You know? Now, if you just give him some food, mm -hmm. you don't have you don't have to tell him to give up hunger. Mm -hmm. Hunger will be gone. He, he'll forget the hunger. Mm -hmm. uh, but you you know if he's standing there hungry, you can say 
give up hunger till you're blue in the face, but I mean, he's he's still going <laughs> to feel that craving. <laughs> well, and and I th I think that the statement "give up the seeking" again it, it and and I I acknowledge that a lot of people that are saying this are saying it from the best place, but it does come it does it does appear to come from a a place of arrogance to say give up the search because. To say give up the search is assuming that someone's doing something wrong when really a teaching or, or being a teacher is an opportunity to say here are the possibilities you might be excluding and here's a way for you to have an experience that doesn't limit you and gives you the most availability to all perspectives. I mean just to know the availability of choices opens your reality up to such a bigger world that that in itself starts to feel a lot, starts to give you a sense of relief that doesn't necessarily lead you to knowing what choice to make. It's just the availability of choices opens you up to how much there is to explore. Now, to answer that question in terms of giving up the search, the way I like to kind of adjust that statement is instead of giving up the search, I invite people to explore and contemplate why they're searching. Mm -hmm. So why are you, not give up the search like it's right or wrong, why are you searching? Yeah. Why are, not what are you searching for, because that's a different inquiry. Mm -hmm. Because then that question becomes very limited too, because then people go, I'm, and they state, I'm searching for awakening, consciousness. My question is, why are you searching? I imagine most people would say, um, because I don't feel fulfilled, you know, I don't feel happy. I feel like there's some emptiness, something missing, mm -hmm. and I want to find that so I don't feel this way. Right, and then, right, then my question would be, hypothetically speaking, in this, you know, this, mm -hmm. okay, is fulfillment a feeling? I think, well, I'm going to, well, based upon my own 44 years of spiritual practice, um, it's it has its feeling level component yes but but that feeling level component is based upon something more fundamental right you know right yeah yeah so we could say that the feeling is how it's being interpreted and expressed right but that it's, it's how it shows up in the body maybe or in the heart or in the emotions or whatever but it's there's some deeper roots to it right so kind of like if a, the feeling of fulfillment was like a balloon at a party Mm -hmm. You would see balloons present at the party, like the feeling is present when fulfillment has been realized, but that not everywhere you see a balloon is going to mean a party. <laughs> right. <laughs> so then if we go to a party with all these balloons, and then every time we see a balloon we think we're attending a party, that might be a little bit of an overstatement or a misperception. Right. So in the same way I would say, yes, we can experience fulfillment as a feeling, but the next inquiry would be, is fulfillment actually located in feeling alone and perhaps the looking for it on that level is already taking us in a direction that's not as clear and perhaps that's why we feel like things are more difficult or that we learn to doubt ourselves because we're trying to succeed at the things that can't be succeeded at. Also, I think we have to qualify the word fulfillment. I mean, a mm -hmm. person might have just eaten a good meal and feel, ah, I'm fulfilled, or just mm -hmm. had, you know, sex, or or had, sure. you know, won the lottery or something. They're, they're mm -hmm. feeling fulfilled mm -hmm. in a way which probably isn't going to last. Um, <laughs> you know, right. so the, so there are deeper dimensions to the the notion of fulfillment. So maybe fulfillment is, and the way people perceive it, maybe fulfillment is the rest. I imagine experiencing when I no longer obligate myself to seek or maintain. Let me rephrase that as a way of making sure I understood what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you kind of saying that fulfillment, mm -hmm. as, as we're kind of referring to it here, mm -hmm is a state which is a sort of a condition, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. wh which um, takes the air out of the, 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 the drive or the necessity to seek uh, mm -hmm. gratification through any relative means. Mm -hmm. That really, the real fulfillment is freedom from seeking or maintaining in right. reality. But, yeah. then, but then the misperception is that people say, I can only be free of seeking or maintaining once I've gotten life to appear as only I think it needs to appear. 
And of course, the appearance of life, even if you get it to look a certain way, is going to, of course, once you start getting to that kind of state of everything is finally looking the way I want to look, of course, once it's begun to look the way you want to look, it's already beginning to end, and life's impermanent nature reveals itself, and then you go from needing to seeking it to look a certain way, to now having to defend the way it looks and try to keep life from changing, which, which of course is impossible. So the, the idea is that people say, when I get life to be the way I want to be, or when life can finally be the way I want to be and never change again, then I'll finally reach the fulfillment. But the reality of fulfillment is actually being completely free of needing to seek or maintain anything, which then just allows life to bring you what it brings you, and you face it whenever you face it, one moment at a time. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the whole description of, that you just gave of getting life to be the way you want it to be, mm -hmm. all it, it pertains to rearranging the deck chairs. It, it pertains to relative of considerations. Course. Of and course. The, the kind of fulfillment that we're referring to mm -hmm. is founded in something which is unconditioned, which is not relative. Right. You at, at, the, at the same time, that what we're pointing to as being unconditioned, eternal, ever-present, without the influence of the relative existence, motivates a lot of people to then push away the relative world as if spending time only in the absolute, having no consideration for the relative, is going to somehow get one to a deeper sense of fulfillment, which of course doesn't do that. It actually just leads to the same seeking and maintaining on an absolute level which is the same mechanism that was at play in the relative. It's just the same relative game being played in an, you know, in a world of, in a world decorated by absolute wallpaper. Yeah, I was a student of uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and he he was always fond of saying 200% of life, you know, 100% <laughs> absolute, 100% relative, and both together. And, totally. Um, and also, I mean, the point you just made. I, I believe the kind of fulfillment we're talking about is not something which one has to exert an iota of effort to maintain. Right. It's, it's something which, when dawns, um, is rock-like. It's unshakable. Right. And, it, yeah. uh, you know, you could be thrown in a jail cell, but it's not going to be um, perturbed. No, not at all. And at the same time, it depends upon one's level of interest and sincerity to explore that ever-present eternal reality that then reflects how deeply one realizes it and eventually embodies it as or, and recognizes it as their natural way of being. Yeah. Well, there's, we're back to our sincerity. <laughs> to sincerity be. to explore. It's like... Uh... At the same time, what I would also say to add to this, again, because again, not, not to so that the relative and absolute can start to come into an integrated understanding mm -hmm. is that yes there is an absolute reality seeing all this as untouched by all of this mm -hmm. and yet on a relative level the things that arise within us are only the expressions of that absolute that are here to be acknowledged and loved unconditionally and equally to all other parts so for example just to give an example I have, met with, I have met with people that have been seeking on paths for many different years, studied with many different teachers, and they said, nothing I did is make the seeking stop. Mm -hmm. And I simply, you know, just intuitively suggested that perhaps if all expressions of the one eternal reality are here to be acknowledged, embraced, and loved by its own self, just as a celebration of loving and embracing everything with equality, then perhaps the, tr the need to either identify with seeking or the need to unravel seeking is missing the simplicity of recognizing that the one who constantly seeks is actually what's next in line to be loved and adored equal to the spiritual one who does everything perfectly. And in one split second, that realization, I've seen people collapse into a million pieces and what shines through in that moment is beyond any cultivation of spiritual practice and any realization through the words of any concepts or teachings, but it is a realization of, I'm only playing out what I haven't recognized is here to be loved and acknowledged equally. And when I don't acknowledge and love equally within myself, I equally experience a world where I find such lack of equality in all experiences and encounters, and I find these qualities that I think spirituality is going to dismiss or unravel as getting deeper and darker and yuckier simply as a way of saying how loud does this alarm clock have to be to get you to love what's here to be loved with equality 
and that the whole basis of what we call Dark Night of the Soul is meeting all the different aspects and archetypes within the one true self that have been waiting in line to be loved and have just not gotten to the front of the line yet. And so a lot of times, and again I can tell you from personal experiences, having faced some of the darkest, most angry, most desperate energy within myself through this exploration and being willing to allow it to do what it's going to do, if it wants to yell, if it wants to scream, if it wants to threaten to take my life, it can go, it can, it, I give it full permission to do so and I'm only going to love it and embrace it no matter whether it threatens this existence or not, and only in that kind of an uncompromising sincerity, which I can't describe why I would choose that, it just kind of happened, is where I was able to see not only what survives this relative journey, but to take a journey where everything that would arise would be only be there to be loved and embraced, and in the end, only that love and sincerity is what survives. And so, again, I just think it's very interesting where people can be seeking, they can be suffering, they can be not doing their spiritual techniques correctly, and yet the irony is, of course I'm not doing this correctly because the one that can't do anything right is next in line to be loved. Of course I can't stop seeking because the one that's seeking is here to be loved equal to the one who's doing everything perfectly. That type of insight starts to blow the lid off of a lot of misunderstandings and starts to bring everything together so that spirituality can be a celebration of inclusion. And if it's a celebration of inclusion, it is a journey of equality. Hmm. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here now. Yeah. Uh, I get emails from people mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to hear anybody's personal story. I just want to hear what they have to teach. <laughs> and then I get other emails from people saying, oh, you've got to have people tell their personal stories. Of course. It's, it's so interesting to hear what they went through, you know, and I don't <laughs> care if it's different than what I went through, but it's, yeah. so, you know, you, you hear, you know, dozens and dozens of people each telling their personal stories, and it's just fascinating <laughs> to, you know, experience the diversity and variety sure. uh, with which this unfolds. So uh, we spent the first hour or so talking about, you know, kind of what you have to teach. And, and, you know, in keeping with the principle that it doesn't have to be either or, but, you know, both can be part of a larger package, yeah. let's, let's shift back to your personal story. And, okay. you know, from as early an age as you feel is significant, and let's, <laughs> let's kind of go through a chronology of it, you know, hitting upon whatever you feel has been meaningful. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I have to, uh, it, it's funny, I have met people also, and I, of course, in saying that, I can say I, I spent a very short period of time of course, we all spend a short period of time playing out some of these things. You know, mm -hmm. you, there, there's a period of time where we play out this idea of, oh, I don't want to hear anyone's story, and no, you become the lieutenant of the story police. We all right. do that, right? Yeah, that's just your story. <laughs> yeah, oh, which is which, and then you come to a much deeper, more beautiful realization, which is why would I ever not want to hear what the divine has experienced? That's how yeah. I see it. So, right. but um, and I have to use my intuition to recall some of my memories because I really don't. I actually don't even have any recollection of what we just did an hour ago. So. Um, we didn't it, do anything. We just started this. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, welcome back. Hey, Con. welcome. <laughs> Honestly, it, it, every moment of the day feels exactly the same to me. I could have just woken up five minutes ago. I'd, have, I'd, I'd never know the difference. But yeah. when I was five, mm -hmm. and it just comes up right now, when I was five, I had an experience where I was walking to a friend's house, and there was a wall that divided, uh, like a brick wall that divided my property from theirs. And I looked at this wall and I had this experience. And of course, when I was five, I didn't know, I hadn't been well seasoned by life. So of course, I didn't have anything to compare it with. So there was no like realization music in the background. There was no, you know, oh my God, this means something. But I was looking at this brick wall and I stopped and I just stared at it. And I had this, and I had this sense that I'm not the, I'm not the body that I'm aware of. I'm not the wall that I'm seeing, I'm the space in between. And I had no idea what that meant. Hmm. It was a deep sense of, I'm not this body, I'm not the wall I'm seeing, I'm the space in between it. And then I just moved on and went to my friend's house and played you, you Nintendo. You mean that you were the space, the, the 10 feet or so between your body and the wall, you were mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and of course it had nothing to do with future realizations that that space between the objects is, of course, the reality within the objects, of course. Mm -hmm. But when it, at that age, for some reason, I remember that experience was like, huh, but it didn't mean anything to me. I just kind of moved on and uh, went and played video games with my friend. And then when I was eight, uh, I went to sleep like any other night 
and I found myself in, in the most amazing garden, and I thought I was having a dream, but I mean the colors in this garden were so bright and vibrant. The colors were so bright, it was kind of like a million, it would be like watching HD mm. on steroids. I mean, it was, it was, the lights were so bright, it was actually emanating this love, and it was a love that I had never actually really felt. I mean, I'd felt my parents' love, but this was like a totally extraordinary, different kind of a love. And at that age, when I was growing up, my biggest fear was um, being displaced from my family or being kidnapped. And so being in unfamiliar places was very scary for me. And so my first sense in this garden with these extraordinary colors was I had this thought of I should be scared, but I'm not. And I felt the most held and loved. And I, and, and I as a child, was so overly sensitive to being able to feel what other people were feeling that I, I had, I had uh, identified with the insecurity I felt in others. And so as a young child, I felt very insecure. So having an experience of security was profoundly different. And so it was very palpable because I never knew what security really felt like because I was always identifying with the doubt that I felt in other people's bodies. And so I'm in this garden. And I'm walking around the garden, and then I see like a field of waist-high flowers. And I start feeling what it's like to move with my legs through these fields of waist-high flowers. And then I realize that as I'm feeling what it's like to walk through the flowers, I'm actually hovering above them simultaneously. Hmm. And I remember thinking, that's, that's interesting. I couldn't explain it, but the love was so palpable, it's kind of like it didn't even matter. Hmm. It's kind of like when you're in a dream, and something makes sense, and you don't know why it makes sense, but you just kind of go with it. And so... I was hovering above this field of waist-high flowers. About 20 feet in front of me was this being in a white robe with dark hair and a beard. I had no idea who it was. And as I looked closely, um, the being was motioning me towards them. And I didn't move at all. I was frozen. And then I started to float towards this being that was equally hovering above the flowers. And when I got about 10 feet from the being, I saw that their eyes were just glowing with this pure white light. And at that moment, I had the thought of, um, it reminded me of when people roll their eyes upward, like in a scary movie. As yeah. an eight-year-old, that was just my only association of, oh, like in those scary movies. And at that moment, I fell through the garden. I saw myself falling through the sky. Mm -hmm. And I fell back in my body, which is how I knew I had left it, because I thought it was a dream. Uh -huh. And I was shaking and sweating. It was like a cold sweat. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw the same being out of this chalky white, like what I would call etheric energy material, motioning me towards him. And I looked, and the being disappeared. Hmm. And then I went to my friend's, a different friend, uh, friend's house the next day. Actually, let me back up. So I told my parents the next morning what happened, because my parents are very open-minded, um, and would listen to me talk about these kinds of things. And it turned out that my dad had had the, nearly the same experience, detail for detail, 25 or 30 years before I did. Hmm. Which I thought was just, you know, it, it didn't, at that moment, it didn't mean anything. It just showed me that, you know, there is some sort of higher order going on in everything. Yeah. And then I went to my friend's house, and I, and I didn't really talk about it. But on their wall, they had this really big framed picture of Jesus. And I didn't know who that was. And I said, that's who I saw in, in, in the garden. You know, my friend's like, Matt, you're Jewish. You know, Jewish people don't. <laughs> Jewish people so, don't. So was Jesus. Apparently so. <laughs> yeah. And a very good carpenter, apparently. But, yeah. And I said, that's who I saw in the garden. I didn't know who he was. I just knew that was uh, who I saw in the garden. And from that moment forward at eight years old, and even knowing as Jesus didn't mean anything to me, it was just like, oh, that's, that's the person I saw. I would be able to walk. And I could feel and see in my peripheral vision the presence of these beings and this white etheric energy, and they would be like walking with me. Hmm. And I was talking to one of my friends about this, and some of my friends would think I'm crazy. And they say, "Well, who are these beings?" I say, and I would say intuitively, "Oh, they're my guides." This and is like all the time. Yeah, I would, from yeah. The, from the from the eight-year-old experience, I could feel them and see them walking mm -hmm. with me. And okay. my friend would say, "Who are they?" And I'd say, "Well, these are my guides." And they say, "Well, what's a guide?" And I'd say, "I don't know." So half the time, my intuition would tell me the right answer. And then at the same time, I was still in an eight-year-old mentality of not knowing anything. Right. Like, I didn't know why they were guides. I knew they were my guides as clearly as I, and I can see them and hear them and feel them as clearly as I'm talking to you. And it was a knowing that is as deep as saying, I'm sitting in a chair right now. I mean, it was, it was the kind of level of knowing 
that nothing can actually shake. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just one of those kind of things. And so... Um, so was there communication with them or did guidance from them or anything like that? When I was 18, <clears throat> they started speaking to me, but not so, until then. So it took 10 years for them to... Yeah. Okay. From that point on, I just, <laughs> I continued my well-seasoning process <laughs> mm -hmm. of getting broken down by the calamity of life and, yeah. you know, learning about ego. Uh, high school. High school and <laughs> uh, middle school and, uh, yeah. you know. Puberty and all Puberty. That and, and, and for me, the, the interesting thing and, and what helped me develop my intuition but was also a very difficult journey was I could, from an early age, feel what was going on in every person's body I would talk to. Mm -hmm. But I, I made the mistake, and of course, I'm sure on purpose, but I thought that what I felt in their body was what they thought of me. Ah. So I spent most of my life apologizing to people wow. and trying to fix their life from like eight years old on because I thought once they feel better in their body, that means I'm liked. What percentage of people um, didn't feel like they disliked you because they had so little, so little garbage in their bodies, or was it pretty much a world of dark people? Exactly. It was, uh, I was living in a world where my family loved me. I had friends and family that thought the world of me. I've had experiences of having many levels of success in a lot of things I've done. And I've had some experiences that, you know, I, I can look back and go, wow, you know, like... I, just experiences that just I could go wow that's an extraordinary experience you know I, I've had I've had a, a wealth of of experiences and yet I can also tell you that no matter how much I've been loved and adored by people or how, how successful I've been in everything I've done it never made a dent I never believed it hmm. because I didn't know that what I was feeling was not what they thought of me was actually just what they were experiencing in their own life of being well seasoned when did you finally realize that that was the case? Um, well, so when I was 18, they started speaking to me. Mm -hmm. My first experience of talking with Ascended Masters and Archangels um, was, you know, they said to me, you know, you're not who you think you are. And my response to them was, who the hell are you? Because, <laughs> I mean, I could... It was the well, yeah, they'd been around for 10 years, though. But for right? some reason, that moment, it was just the response that came through me. It was just one of those silly things. And so okay. then from 18 on, I would sit in my bedroom of my parents' house after school or whatever, and I'd sit there and I would, you know, hear, feel, and see these beings, and they would teach me things about the universe. And I remember saying once when I was talking, and every day I would meet a different one, you know, this one's Archangel this, and this one's... W would they speak in English? Yeah, it, but it was a telepathic thing. Right, but it's a language you understood. And, and would they say, sort of, would they identify themselves, I'm Archangel Michael, mm -hmm. or w whatever? They, that... mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm uh, Jesus. I'm Mother Mary. I'm Ganesh. I'm and again and I st again just and would you see them clearly? I mean, would you mm -hmm. see Ganesh with his elephant nose and mm -hmm. you know the whole deal? Sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes they'd come as symbols. They would come as like a certain symbol. And and I, I, I again just to kind of go forward a little bit, all spirit guides and angels that we experience are just archetypes of the divine. And of course, the bigger realization is if angels and ascended masters are archetypes of the divine. The deeper realizations that every being and individual we see are equally archetypes of the divine. So right. it's just the divine speaking to itself. And so I was. We are that divine, ultimately. Right. <laughs> so so it was the divine. Us. Right. So the divine was basically just playing this game of, you know, telephone with itself. And yeah. so I would learn what I learned from the ascended masters. They would give me instructions every day. They would say, you know, make whatever choice you'd make. Sometimes I'd even make the opposite choice they'd suggest just so I could learn for myself. Can you give us a, one or two examples of specific instructions or specific knowledge they imparted? Um, like I would be worried about something coming up, and they would say, "Just you know, let it go. It's not really important." Like and, a, te a test. At yeah, or so, or like I, for me, my my biggest. Well, I used to take tests, by the way. Um, I wouldn't study. I would. I, my, my greatest fantasy was trying to improv my way through everything. So, <laughs> so I never studied for tests. I always thought, let me just see if I could just you know feel it out, which. Uh -huh. I don't recommend, but, you know, anyway, at that age, I didn't have enough focus to really mm. have an interest in school. Th this that I was learning from the universe was my only interest. Um, but, like, I would have, like, something would happen in an inter interaction with people, like at school, or just, you know, how friends get in their little stuff. And I'd be worried about, oh, I guess, I, you know, this means they hate me, or this girl's going to break up with me. And, you know, you're basically 
experiencing the loss and waiting for them to call and guarantee it. And so they'd say, oh, don't worry about it. And of course, I would sit there and not listen to that and just feel like, you know, I have the right to suffer or something like that. So they're, or, they, or they would say, um, they would, you know, I would say, oh, I'm going to go do this. And they'd say, well, why don't you try this? And I would deliberately do the opposite just to see that what they were offering me was was clear, and, and it also gave me the opportunity to not live my life subservient to this type of insight, but to be able to have the intelligence and willingness to say, I have the power to choose this, versus I have to do this. The universe is telling me I have to get an ice cream cone, <laughs> versus I can just say, I'm just going to choose this. And so I would work with the Ascended Masters and Archangels. I worked with them for so many years. It all came to one big experience where they, you know, I went up into, sometimes what happens, I'd close my eyes and go into a meditation and I'd, I'd find myself whisked off into some other dimension and experiencing things. Um, and whenever I'd go into a different dimensional experience, the reason I knew it was a different dimensional experience is because the whole feeling of it feels different. When you experience different dimensions, the gravity of it feels different. It, everything just feels really different. So it, it's, it's just, it's a very surreal quality. So I went up into what is called the Akashic Records, mm -hmm. you know, which looks like, to me, what it looked like was the Lincoln Memorial, the outside of the Lincoln Memorial with the steps and the pillars, and there was a light table, and all the Ascended Masters were standing in front of the table waiting for me, and I kind of walk up, you know, hey, guys, you know, <laughs> little old me, you know, hey, and they said, we want to show you something, and so they all lifted up their masks, which I didn't know were masks, and they were all me underneath, hmm. and, I, and I gasped when it happened, but the funniest thing is I say to all these beings I'm in front of, and I said, I don't get it. Yeah. And so they said to me, what I'll say to you, they said, if you were to go into your past and visit yourself as a child, that child you wouldn't see you as its evolution. It would see you as everything it doesn't know itself to be. So it could only see you as a celestial being or as a spirit guide. Mm. They said, we're not only what you're becoming, we're what you've already become, and we are here stepping back in the dream of time to visit ourselves in spiritual childhood. Hmm. And at that moment, that was when the Matt speaking to Ascended Masters, right? Matt, who had the universe on speed dial, became the realization of there is this reality in which all forms of intelligence exist, but it's that intelligence communing with all different aspects of itself in a dream of conversation or a dream of interaction. And that's when all of a sudden I started to be able to not only use, of course, my intuitive abilities that have been honed through these experiences, but to know that what I am bringing through is what I am. So it's not get mad out of the way. It's not that Matt is channeling Ascended Masters. It's knowing that the Ascended Mastery of Existence is actually channeling personalities in a costume party of existence. Hmm. And so it's, it, it then led me f from the esoteric across a bridge into what people call the non-dual, but I didn't seek a non-dual teacher. I didn't even know the term non-duality until people started telling me the, the, the type of information I was saying. I just went on my own exploration, and I let the intuition that at that point was very well developed to be my only guide. And that over many years brought me to where I am right now. Cool. So the intuition just sort of led you into a non-dual experience and mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then I would read the non Then I would read some of the way the teachers would describe or point, and I would understand what they were talking about, but it didn't necessarily, to me, feel like the end-all, be-all. So when people would make certain teachings the end-all, be-all, it was kind of like, you know, valuing one piece of the puzzle instead of stepping back and seeing the whole picture. Yeah. Well, I imagine reading different teachers, it would just affirm or concur mm -hmm. with what you already had come to experience. Yeah, well, you know, what was interesting is that I had been living in that, in that awake awareness, if you want to call it that, for quite a long time. So when I would read a lot of these revered teachers, and, and again, they're all beautiful writings because, again, every, every heart is a revered teacher because every heart is here to use life as their living or written or spoken interactive journal to express its own divine nature to its own divine audience, which is just the divine, you know, experiencing itself to itself. So I think everything is really quite beautiful. Um, but for me, what was interesting is that, and it wasn't the teachers doing this at all. It was a lot of the people that I saw that were, you know, seeking or, or, or affiliate with the teachers. What I got confused by was that everyone was making this such a big deal. 
and my experience of it was it actually wasn't that big of a deal. That my that for me the big deal was the beauty and the honor and the preciousness of life. Mm-hmm. So I would meet people who were like kind of arrogantly, you know, downgrading life and oh the material world, and that never made any sense to me because I had no idea what people are talking about. Because for me, I was already seeing that the material world was a living decoration of the non-physical world. So I, calling it the material world made no sense to me at all. Thinking of it as this big thing like, and when I emerge with the divine, and that made no sense to me. So, so for me, it was very confusing. And I, and I came to this place where I either had to trust what I knew and what I could see, or, I, or I, I had to assume that I am completely crazy and everyone else knows what they're talking about and I am going to spend the rest of my life in some sort of padded room. <laughs> and, and so for me, it was really just taking that step to say, you know, I have to basically trust what I feel and see, I have to trust what I know. And, and, and that led me to a place where, where now I think that, you know, I can be helpful in helping to create a new integrated way of looking and experiencing this where it doesn't have to be about rejecting life, but about a returning to life. Hmm. Well, I've heard you say that, you know, it's your understanding uh, that, People are naturally at different levels of experience. Yes. Uh, I think it was Ramana Maharshi who said there are no levels of awareness, but there are levels of experience. Yes. Uh, you know, so people can, and some are in kindergarten, and some are in third grade, and some are in high school, and some are in college, and some are postgraduate. And, you know, your guy, who I would say happens to have been born mm-hmm. at a fairly high level of experience. Yes. Uh, fairly, you, you know, you're born in graduate school or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, when you talk about interacting with other seekers and so on, maybe some of those are just in high school. Some of them are in grammar sure, school. And so, sure. and so And so they're just going to kind of do what they do, be what they are. And um, anyway, I, you know where I'm going with this. No, I do. And what was interesting is that it's, you know, again, all grades are present at, at one eternal campus. Yes. Which is the hilarity of it. And, and, and they're all in different class. You know, we're, all in this, we're all mixed together in the same classroom. So... Mm-hmm. But what I but what I think is interesting. Another metaphor is we're all on the same boat. Some happen to be in the bow, some happen to be in the stern, but sure, we're all on sure. the same boat and it's just totally. going along. <laughs> take it carrying us all. I think to not know or to not take seriously like whether how developed I was when I came in was a big blessing because it allowed me to go through the entire egoic journey. It allowed me to experience everything people experience and to speak in a way where I can speak about it as being someone who has lived in the world as well as who experiences the world in the way that I do, which again, just when I started to see this, for me it wasn't like I had this realization of I see what people don't see and I need, you know, and and I think the world needs to wake up. It didn't come from that kind of a spiritual sense of, you know, like this is what needs to happen in the world, right? The world's going to hell, we need to wake up. What came to me was I realized people weren't experiencing what I was experiencing, right. and, there, and there was this sense in me that I couldn't sit back. This was just my sense. I, couldn't, I remember I thought, and this came to me one day, I can't sit back and just kick my feet up and go, well, I experience things and some people don't. That's just the way it is. Right? For me, it actually birthed this fire in me, and the fire was... I want to use these abilities and do everything I can to give people the opportunity to experience all that can be experienced. And if I represent something that people have yet to experience, then I will only dedicate my time to giving people opportunities to experiencing that within themselves. That is what erupted me and what led me where I am today. Just that interest in, I can't just sit back and go, well, you know, some people are just the way they are, and whoops, you know, hey, they're not evolved, you know, and to get into that kind of thing. That, that yeah. for me, made me very disgusted. In fact, when I first came into the spiritual community, uh, I was very confused because I thought I was going to, you know, run down the halls of a new high school and meet all my spiritual buddies, and we're all going to just, you know, just have, you know. And, and then I came into the community, and just as far as my experience was, I found myself very disgusted by some of the levels of arrogance about like, oh, you know, these are evolved beings and people need our help. Instead of really just being, you know, if people are unaware of certain experiences, then I want to be able to help people have the experiences for no other reason but to really know the infinite possibility of infinite possibility. And that's where my life of service really kind of came from, is just wanting people to have 
all the experiences that they want to have and not kind of make something that I'm experiencing as, as something to put in a cage or on a zoo exhibit. Yeah, no, I think that's what drives most genuine teachers and sometimes with a sort of a burning intensity, there's this mm. drive to sort of, you know, enable others to, you know, enjoy that um, richness and fulfillment that they're experiencing. Absolutely. And, and again, when I first came in the spiritual community, I, saw, I, would, I, would, I would experience like the spiritual community as a refuge from the material everyday life, the material world. And that never made sense to me because I didn't understand the whole idea of needing to take a break from everyday life. Like, for example, when I was a kid, a lot of people would find a lot of peace in nature. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I never liked nature. Not that I didn't like it. I just didn't seem very impressed by it. And what I realized is that what I was already experiencing everywhere in the concrete jungles of Los Angeles mm -hmm. was the kind of space and break that people only felt in the stillness of nature. I didn't get that. By the way, I didn't even realize that I was like in my late 20s, early 30s. I just went around thinking my whole life that maybe I just don't appreciate nature. I didn't <laughs> realize that that was something that I, from a very early age, already had experienced and realized. And of course, I didn't know I realized it because there was no... There's nothing else to compare it with, but mm -hmm. this idea of needing to take, needing to escape life, the material world, for something more spiritually relevant, or, you know, which on the esoteric school, on the esoteric level, people need to apparently escape their material world and go hang out with the angels in the higher realms, just like people in the non-dual community are trying to rest in the emptiness of awareness and trying to get away from the relative. I, I found that to be very confusing, and so what, what I started to, to see as I started to you know, have this burning desire to assist and just to give people the opportunity to experience all the things that, that are possible was to help people see in their own way that the relative and absolute are the same. Yeah. And having said all that, and having uh, and and agreeing with what you just said, yeah. I would also I would also add that it's completely appropriate and fine for those who are so inclined to go into monasteries, totally. uh, Mount Athos or whatever they that lifestyle. Yeah, uh, you know, because it's you know, different strokes for different folks again. Well, you know, and it's it's not as if there is a wrong path, but right. there is a difference between how sincerely we approach it or how tainted our approach is based on our expectations or what we hope to get out of it. So, so there is either the strategy of expectation or there's the sincerity of exploration. And my point of view really isn't like people should or shouldn't go to monasteries because, you know, again, everyone is a unique expression of this path, so every path is going to be expressed and celebrated. It's yeah, more everybody so... Everybody has their own proclivities. Right. It's just a matter of my interest is how sincerely is that path or experience being expressed or experienced or embraced, and life will show you how sincerely or how much agenda fills any kind of exploration depending upon the disharmony that arises. And so my interest is just helping and assisting others in being able to walk whatever path they're on with the deepest level of sincerity and the most direct amount of insight so that their life can be the most enjoyable celebration of the divine they already are. So for you, was there any kind of moment which you could have marked on a calendar which at which there was like, boom, awakening, or was it more of a grow, uh, kind of a subtle growth process from an early age that you, you really, there were no radical, um, you know, shifts or, or jumps or... Right. Well, the lightning bolt getting that hit, that, that, was pretty, it, that was pretty memorable in the... Uh, oh, with the Ram Dass, you mean? Ram Dass, lightning bolt, Shakti Pot, whatever, was pretty uh, memorable, and then, of course... Um, the exploding energy, the egg exploding in my head and oozing out of my ears. The target oh, was pretty... The, the uh, target experience, yeah. <laughs> was, was, was pretty memorable. I remember once, um, and not that this was, I think, the point of arrival, but I just remember it as a very clear uh, memory, was I had an, I went on a walk around my neighborhood, and, and just this, I had this, you know, experience of, of, of opening or awakening. 
And I remember that moment, the words came to me, not that the words I've held on to, but I just think it was pretty interesting, the words that came through, was I was just standing on my block, and I had this thought of, I once was a person standing in a space, mm. and now I'm the space where a person stands. Nice. And so it was like everything shifted and nothing happened at the same time. Yeah. So it's kind of like I, I took a walk around my neighborhood, and at one point I, I turned the corner, and I just walked out of myself. I'm sorry, your voice garbled right there. That was oh, important, important uh, what you just said. So it's like I took a walk around my neighborhood, and as I turned a corner, I just walked out of myself. Oh. I just kept walking, almost like when you walk out of a pair of shoes. Yeah. I just walked, and I walked out of the shoes and kept walking, and the shoes were left behind. And then I realized what I realized. You know, I once was a person standing in a space, and now I'm the space where a person stands. And I remember there was just this sense of I've always been what I've always been. I just thought it was always something else, right? Like I had always been myself. Right. I just thought that was a body, a personality to defend. I thought, you know, in a world of other different people. Like I, so I've always been myself. That was the realization. But what I thought myself to be was what made it so confusing and painful. I see. You, you thought yourself to be something other than that, which you actually were. Right. So I'd always been myself. It's just what I thought that was was just decorations of that. But, but in confusing that, of course, I had lived my life defending the honor, maintaining the integrity, or trying to cultivate and practice the accumulation of what added to the well-being of this character mm -hmm. and trying to escape, push away, and overcome anything that put that at risk. And so, and, and then when I realized I am what I've always been, but just thought it to be something it wasn't, that all kind of disappeared. And when I started experiencing life for the first time with nothing to seek and nothing to want and nothing to need, it wasn't for me like this realization of like, oh, that means I've experienced this or I'm in a state of non-attachment or there wasn't any of the, those kinds of ideas of this means something. It was actually a very surreal, odd sense. It was just... I had never experienced that before, and it wasn't bad, it wasn't negative, it was just, huh. And I remember that was the experience for me was, huh. Because I had never, never not needed, I had never not wanted. And so, and, and so the, the funny realization for me was, was I was experiencing not wanting and not needing effortlessly. And then I was laughing about how, how any of this can ever be wanted. You can't want this. You can't need this. You can only want to need your ideas of this. Right, and, right. and yet, even when you attain your ideas of what you think awakening is, that will be what you actually wake up from. Yeah. And so for me, if there was a point of arrival, it wasn't when I was eight or when I met the Ascended Masters and I realized they're all me and all that kind of stuff. The point of arrival, if there was one, which it doesn't feel like there ever is one, for me in my journey was the realization of the spiritual dream is what I actually woke up from. Hmm. It was waking up out of the spiritual journey and in waking up out of the spiritual journey I discovered life. And I discovered that spirituality for me and the way I define it is the willingness to embrace and celebrate the equality of life in every moment. So for me, life became spiritual. Every breath became spiritual. The world became my ashram. Every being was an ascended master. Everything I saw was the divine. And it still didn't exclude the fact that I would have moments of happiness and sadness, but it didn't mean anything anymore, right? There was no grieving process when disappointment showed up. It was, it was just a full willingness to step into every moment and nothing actually mattered, but it wasn't like a withdrawal that it didn't matter. It was like a di it didn't I didn't mind. So I was it was I didn't mind. So I I just stepped into everything. Hmm. And yeah, yeah. Cool. All righty. Well, you and your partner Julie Dumar, yeah. um, you travel, you teach, you give seminars or retreats or yes. you know one on one consultations and and all sorts of things. Um, and we'll 
when we wrap up here, I'll I'll make some announcements about that and, and okay. so on. Um, and uh, just yesterday, somebody sent me an email. He lives in the Seattle area, and he said, you know, I looked on Matt's website. I've seen Matt a couple of times, and <laughs> and now he's charging 195 bucks an hour for some kind of star seed activation and DNA <laughs> something or other. And, and he said that seems a little mercenary to me, a little crass. He, he said, would you please ask Matt about that? And and, and so I said, all right, I'll, I'll just ask him and see what he says. I mean, mm-hmm. um, for, I suppose there's two components to that. One is, you know. Is 195 a little steep? I don't know. Money is relative, and <laughs> uh, and uh, you know if you can, if you can charge that and and whatever, then more power to you, I suppose. And, and another is, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of these things. I mean, DNA activation mm-hmm. and and whatnot. I, I've been hearing that for years. I wonder if any, anyone's ever looked with an electron microscope and seen any noticeable change in DNA, or maybe it's on an etheric level and you wouldn't see it on a sure. microscope. So maybe you could address all those. Of course, issues. of course. Yeah. So. Um, well, when I started doing the starseed activation, again, it was just spontaneously one day I had a conversation, you know, download come to me from the universe, which I go through downloads all the time. That's where I get all the teachings and all the, you know, things that I say that, you know, some people think it was an original difference because I just get it from that place. It just comes to me. And then I share what comes to me. And so then I was taught this process called the starseed activation, which is to activate the dormant aspects of our multidimensional self and to activate the crystal DNA. As I'm being told this, I really don't even, I'm not saying they're asking for the mechanics of it. I'm just, it's just kind of coming through and I'm like, okay. And they're showing me how to do it and how to work with someone and activate this on an etheric level. And again, because I'm very sensitive to energy and I actually see those etheric levels everywhere, mm-hmm. for me, I understand. Okay. And for some people that don't see it, I understand why, how it would sound. But I just go, okay. And then the people that have experienced this activation have just had very interesting profound experiences and I even when I do the activation I say hey let's not expect anything let's just see what happens mm-hmm. you know so it's not like a leading kind of a thing but to get back to the money issue about 195 <laughs> on the website it also says and I, and this is something that I do regularly that any person at any financial who's had any kind of financial situation in their life will be helped and served with these teachings and that if the price that is offered does not fit what is feasible or that would cause undue stress and harm to their financial stability, mm-hmm. uh, a donation can be made in whatever way fits their current financial climate, and they will be given the same exact opportunities, teachings, sessions that anyone else would be. And yes. so I've and so I've never, I've never. They could, like bake you some brownies and send. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about that. I once gave a session. I once gave a session to someone who called me and they said can you meet me at this location it was at a park a few years ago and it turned out this person was homeless uh-huh. and they said I don't have what you usually charge you know and, and I'm you know and they said but here's what is what I believe your teachings are worth in terms of my financial climate right and they handed me a dollar uh-huh. but it was the most heartfelt dollar I've ever received and what they understood, which sometimes people don't understand in the spiritual community, is it's not about charging money for a service and trying to hold people hostage of, if you want your DNA activated, you've got to pay me 195 It's not like a ransom in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. That the money and prosperity we share for the things we receive is a way of giving value to the things that we're going to receive. And that when we allow ourselves to exchange energetically, because money is just a manifestation of energy, when we allow ourselves to exchange value for what we're receiving, we actually, on an energetic level, open ourselves up to receiving that gift and that transmission in a way that will transform someone's life potentially in a very deep way. So, for example, I have also had experiences where people in the past have said, I have zero money. Mm-hmm. And just because I'm... I, in my heart, I never say no to anyone. This is just how I am. It's just how I am as a being. I, I help everyone everywhere. If I go to a restaurant and someone comes up and asks me a question, I will sit them down and I will talk to them as long as I need to. I mean, that's just how I am. Um, it, it, people don't disturb me. I'm here to serve the world. Whenever I've had experience of people who have been uh, against the money or have paid nothing, it has also been a session where, they, where I found that, that that has been someone who has not been very receptive to receiving and they're going very deeply. When I've worked with someone who couldn't pay the full price but were very sincere about, I value your time, 
that someone who has equally had a very profound deep experience. So I look at the ability to charge for, for, for this time and what we do to be a way for people to express the value that is the intention that allows them to really own and honor what they receive in a very deep way. And of course, on the most fundamental level, money doesn't really exist. And if we find ourselves in positions where money seems to be scarce and not flowing as frequently as we'd like, there are also things energetically that can be done to increase that flow. You know, ironically, people, ironically, when we are in the deepest place of gratitude and very uh, moved and living in honor of what we are living and honoring the gifts that others offer us, there tends to be not a lack of resources to allow some of those experiences to happen. In the same way, people could also probably say, just for argument's sake, they could probably say, well, I'm going to eat three times a day anyway. I already have to eat to be a human being. So who the hell is this restaurant to charge me for the meal I'm already going to eat? We can make the argument that way, and it sounds completely ridiculous. It's just when we come into a reality or a realm of spirituality, all of a sudden, and I think it's usually because people think of spirituality in the material world as being these opposites, we come into this idea as if the gifts that we receive or the help that we receive from others should not be celebrated, honored, or valued. Mm. Well, hey, I'm with you. I mean, I taught Transcendental Meditation for 25 years, and mm -hmm. although I think it's rather overpriced these days, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was teaching it, it was like $35 for students and 75 for adults or something like that. It was mm -hmm. pretty, cheap, pretty cheap. But even then, people would gripe about it and say, how can you charge money for a spiritual thing? And sometimes I'd cut people some slack if they didn't have the money, but, or if they said they didn't. But what I very often found was that they wouldn't even show up for all their instruction sessions. Exactly. You know, they, they'd come to the first one because there was just a sort of a frivolous curiosity. There wasn't a sincere, um, you know, earnest... Um, kind of inquiry going on and, and so they, right. they wouldn't take it very seriously if you don't if you don't pay I mean again this is this is what I've this is what I've seen in my own experience mm -hmm. and again I, I, I preface this with saying that anyone who is interested in receiving any assistance I can offer who's interested in what, what I offer no matter what financial situation will never be turned away it's never been that way ever even during retreats for example and people have called you know, the retreat price is covering the cost yeah, of the, the center and the money yeah, yeah. that I have nothing to do with. I mean, we're holding at a space, and this place is saying, here's how much you have to charge per yeah. person to cover whatever. So, but knowing that I will never, that Julie and I have never steered away anyone, and we have helped every single person that has come to us from, a, from women living in a crisis shelter mm -hmm. to a homeless person living in the park to any other version of person imaginable, that when you pay in whatever way for the services you're receiving, it matters. Yeah. When you pay, it matters. And when it matters, you value it, you give it your attention, and then you can go the deepest with it and get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I... In the Vedic tradition, yeah. it's called the dakshina. You oh, give, good. Give the teacher a dakshina, sure. which which means like you know some payment for the teaching, and it may be that you tend his cows for a couple of years before sure. you get, get instructed or whatever. Um, in this in this day and age, that's not really practical. But um, <laughs> you know, and you could also say that those who are able to pay, who do pay, kind of cover those who are homeless or living in shelters. I mean, happens all the time. And uh, otherwise, you'd have to quit and get a job. Right. And, and I, I will tell you over the years, just in my own experience, that I even like, for example, we hold our intention that I offer these teachings with the depth, with the utmost of sincerity, compassion and love, so that those will meet these teachings with the utmost sincerity, compassion and love. There have been certain situations where, let's say, someone tells me, oh, or tells Julie, I can only afford this much money, and we can kind of sense that's not really the deepest truth. But we know life is the equalizer. Everything will be made fine. And then the next day, someone pays more than is even being asked because they just felt inspired to, and that turns to, that, that, everything always equals itself out. And so all I can do is be the open, willing space of service, you know, and to offer what I offer, to not exclude anyone from the teachings and offerings because I, I, I have been shown what I've been shown. 
I have been taught what I've been taught, and I transmit what I transmit, only so that every being has the opportunity to have the most vivid and most miraculous experience of existence while they're here in this form. And I, I offer that to all. And I can tell you that it's only in certain spiritual circles that I really ever hear about that kind of um, money issue. And What's even more interesting is that over the years, as things have continuously deepened in my, in my own evolution and seeing, a lot of those kinds of conversations have ended and the frequency of the, have become uh, few and far between. So I think that's pretty interesting as well. Okay, so I think we've spent enough time on the money issue. <laughs> yeah. We covered it. It's a good topic, uh, though. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth addressing. It's worth addressing, and uh, I'm glad you were able if to If somebody talk. brings it up, I mean, you know, so... Yeah, absolutely. They sh they deserve an answer. So we you've given a good one. Good. Let's yeah. let's let's end that chapter. So um, we we've spent about two hours now, is, uh, and I don't necessarily just want to end on the money note. Is there is there <laughs> anything you'd like to say in conclusion that you know you want to leave people with? Well, I think that no matter what is said or what is spoken, that the intention behind the speaking is to embrace and to love all beings as they are however they appear, and to, and to not confuse the fact that what I'm saying or what I'm pointing to, to be able to see and illuminate uh, in ourselves what may have been previously overlooked has nothing to do with the fact of why I speak. I speak to embrace and to love all beautiful beings, to embrace the beauty of life that I see, and to allow all hearts to know how deeply they're loved and to awaken that depth of love so that all that come into their field of vision can be loved as well. I, I speak only f to celebrate love. I speak only as love, and I only see love to all those I speak to. And so, yeah. you know, I really, I really just, if I wish to end with anything, it's to really just know that I serve the love that I am, that you are, and that love is the only thing speaking these words. Beautiful. Well, thanks. Um, this has really been enjoyable, and you know, I'm, and I'll, I'll say what I said in the very beginning, which is that when I met you, that's the impression I got. It was like this <laughs> sort of love bomb, you know, <laughs> 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 and you know, like just great big warm hug and just lots of bliss, and you know, really a delightful person to interact with. Thank you. And Julie too, and, and please um, give give Julie a big hug for me. Um, I will. Yeah, so let me make a couple of quick concluding remarks. Um, I've been speaking with Matt Kahn, who lives in the um, Pacific Northwest, but who travels around giving talks and seminars and so on. He'll be doing a, a retreat or whatever you call it, what, towards the end of February into March? Yes. And, and there's details on his website, which I will link to. And he's also going to give like a 10-day retreat in Greece, which sounds nice to me. Um, and uh, there's details about that on your website. And your website is truedivinepresence.com. True right? Divine Nature. TrueDivineNature.com, and I'll be linking to that from, from my website, so you don't have to remember that. Just go to BatGap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Oh, and incidentally, we're recording this in mid-January of uh, 2012, so if you're seeing this two years later, those retreats have ended, but <laughs> un undoubtedly Matt will be doing something, so go to TrueDivineNature.com, and you'll see what he's up to. Um, <sighs> and... Uh, and again, BatGap.com, which is uh, you know acronym for Buddha at the gas pump, is the repository of all these interviews. Uh, there are over 100 of them now. And if you go there, you can see previous ones. You can sign up to be notified when new ones get posted. Uh, there's a little discussion group crops up around each interview. There's a podcast you can subscribe to so as to listen to this while you're cross-country skiing. And... Uh, <laughs> And probably, oh, and there's a donation button, and uh, if you feel the inclination to click on it, remember you have no free will. There's uh, no one doing anything, so just go, <laughs> Let's go, go, with, go with the flow. Because <laughs> uh, speaking of money, I too can use a bit. Just bought a new computer, which is why you're seeing this in 720p instead of 4, 640 by 480. In other words, it's gotten to, my new computer has given it the capability of higher resolution. And I paid for half of that with bat gap money and half of it with personal money since I also use it for my business. So in any case, um, thank you very much, Matt. And thank you to thank those you. who are listening or have been wa listening or watching. And we will see you next week.